Uh, uh, uh. So, um, this time I'm hoping to get a little bit closer to understanding what Wollstonecraft thinks the ideal society, like the true civilization, would be like. Um, and also, um, in the process, understand better what the problems are that prevent our society from being like that. Those are, I guess, the vestiges of barbarism. Um, and uh, why the subjugation of women is so central to those problems, according to her. Um, because I guess maybe that's something important to emphasize about this book. And maybe I'm not sure if it came out the way I talked about it, its subject and its relationship to the course earlier, that it's not like um, uh, equal rights are good for men, and hey, women should get them too, <laughs> right? It's like no one is going to have a good society as long as this situation persists between men and women, right? This is a problem that absolutely has to be solved. So, um, um, okay, so remember, first of all, the ideal society would be natural. Um, and it would be natural in the sense of that it's based on human nature. Or that is, uh, it's like based on the law of nature. Um, and second of all, when I talk about it before, and it's based this on what she says, but now I'm not even sure. Well, I guess it's not wrong. It just has to be further specified. So what I said before is that the best society would be the most egalitarian, according to her. Um, so, I mean, that's true, but only in a specific sense of it's a specific kind of equality that she thinks there has to be, right? The important thing is that um, no one should have power over anyone else. I'm not, I can't tell if she thinks that's absolutely possible, that there will be no one will ever have any power over anyone else, or if it's just the point is that it should be minimized. Um, but, uh, but it should be minimized to the point where um, everyone is independent. This is like, this is a word that keeps coming up a lot in today's reading. I mean, of course, she's especially focusing on the fact that women are dependent on men. Most women are dependent on men in her society, but it's dependence in general that she thinks is bad, right? So, um, Right, so like in the quote, I actually, from ch in chapter one, where I originally based myself on when I said the best society would be egalitarian, this is how it actually goes, this is on page 15. But one power should not be thrown down to exalt another, for all power inebriates weak man, and its abuses, sorry, and its abuse proves that the more equality there is established among men, the more virtue and happiness will reign in society. Right, and she says something related in today's reading. This is in chapter 10 on page 155. Um, Power, in fact, is ever true to its vital principle, for in every shape it would reign without control or inquiry. Um, so power of any kind uh, is 
uh, inebriating, right? That is, it makes people drunk, so to speak. Um, so it prevents um, rationality and therefore it prevent, prevents virtue and happiness and it resists knowledge. Um, Um, it, it prevents rationality. It's used as, I guess, I would say as a substitute for reason, right? That is, it gives people like kind of pseudo reasons for doing things. Um, so that's the one, the sense in which she thinks that society should be as, as egalitarian as possible. Everyone should be independent of everyone else. That is, no one should have power over anyone else. Um, but on the other hand, she doesn't think it's important that everyone have the same role, or as she would say, station. I think we can kind of, I think this is similar to the way we now use the word role, the way she uses the word station. Right, so um, she doesn't think that it's important that everyone have the same role or station in society. On the contrary, she seems to hold that even in an ideal society, people would have different stations. Um, and um, the different stations would be related to different duties. They'd be related the duties derive from the relationship between the different stations. I think that's why she calls them um, relative duties a lot of times. Right, it's not like relative duties as opposed to absolute duties or something like that. It's duties that are uh, arise from relationship. I think is what she means. So, um, And moreover, because they each had different um, stations and therefore different duties, they would each have different rights against each other. Um, because, um, well, let me just read what she says on page 161. This is in chapter 11. Um, I have before had occasion to observe that a right always includes a duty. And it, I think it may likewise fairly be inferred that they forfeit the right who do not fulfill the duty. Right, so rights derive from duties. And if you don't fulfill the duty, you don't get the right. This is, um, basically Locke's view, which I think Rousseau also agrees with, you get rights under a law when you recognize that law as your duty, right? Or that's when you become, as Locke says, free of that law. Um, but she adds one other thing that I think Locke and Rousseau don't add, which is that from these duties also, from the discharge of the duties, right? That is from actually carrying them out, arise affections. Um, so, I mean, she says this a lot of times in this reading, I think, but uh, maybe the clearest is in chapter nine on page 146. Nature has wisely, wisely attached affections to duties to sweeten toil and to give that vigor to the exertions of reason, which only the heart can give. So like, I mean, you might think this means, and I think she does think this, but it's just that it's not limited to this. You might think this means that if you fulfill your relative duty to someone else, they'll have affection for you, right? That is, they'll like you. Um, and I, like I said, I think she thinks that's true, but, but also, and more importantly, if you fulfill your, um, 
relative duty to someone else, you'll feel affection for them. <laughs> right? I think that's what she means when she says, can we read that again on page 146? Um, Nature has wisely attached affections to duties to sweeten toil and to give that vigor to the exertions of reason, which only the heart can give, right? The exertions of reason are like what makes us recognize our duties because the, the duties derive from the law of nature, which is the law of reason, right? So like, um, she doesn't give a, um, really complicated account or really any account in this book of exactly how we use reason to derive our duty, right? But, um, um, but based on everything we've seen about the law of nature and Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau, you can kind of imagine how this works, right? And so like we use our, our reason to determine- Tim Tim You've arrived. Yeah, so- <laughs> Um, you know, we use our reason to figure out what our duties are. Um, but uh, I mean, it's similar actually, like remember what Rousseau said about the true religion, the religion of reason, right? Like true Christianity. He said that a society of true Christians would, would collapse because everyone would do their duty because it was the right thing to do. But like their heart wouldn't be in it. So um, she's saying nature has wisely attached affections to duty. If you really recognize your duty and do it, then affection will come. Um, okay, so like this is the, you know, um, way the structure is supposed to be. Where do these stations come from, however? And like, are there examples? <laughs> well, I mean, so first of all, you might ask, well, are they natural? Um, so assuming, and uh, I think this is right, that one of these stations is mother, right, that comes with relative duties and affections and rights. Um, so it comes with rights if you fulfill the duty, right? Again, they who don't, who don't fulfill the duty forfeit the right. So, um, so that's one of the stations. Um, and, you know, well, here's one of the things she says about it. This is on, in chapter 10 on page 156. I mean, it's interesting, chapter 10 and chapter 11 are both about the relationship between parents and children. Chapter 10 is really short and it's titled Parental Affection. And then chapter 11 is longer and it's titled Duty to Parents. So anyway, this is in chapter 10 on parental affection. And it says, as the care of children in their infancy is one of the grand duties annexed to the female character by nature, So it's natural. Although this is the end of the sentence, this duty would afford many forcible arguments for strengthening the female understanding if it were properly considered. Right, I mean, so it's natural um, and it's, um, um, Like other natural duties, it uh, requires reason and knowledge to carry it out properly. But on the other hand, here's something else she says about the station of the mother in chapter nine on page uh, 149. The being who discharges the duties of its station is independent. And speaking of women at large, 
Their first duty is to themselves as rational creatures. And the next in point of importance as citizens is that which includes so, it's that which includes so many of a mother. So um, the duty of a mother is a duty that someone has as a citizen. Right? Let me read that again. Speaking of women at large, their first duty is to themselves as rational creatures. And the next in point of importance as citizens is that which includes so many of a mother. So, um, so the duty, the station and the related duties and rights and affections of a mother are natural is what that first quote says, but the second quote says they're civil, right? They're duties of a citizen. Um, a citizen is a member of a um, civitas, a city, a commonwealth, right? Uh, it's, and it goes to the, the etymology goes through French and whatever, but that's right. <laughs> All right. So, um, um, so like these duties are duties of someone in a civil state, and I think um, in particular. The, this is the role that someone would get assigned and the duties they would discharge, et cetera, in a true civilization, right? If we were really civilized, we would really be citizens. And if women were really citizens, they would have the duties of this role or station. Um, So, I mean, what this means is that the stations, like th these, these stations are natural, but they're natural in this sense. Right? Like they're not natural in the sense that these are duties that people recognize in a state of nature. Um, it's the opposite, right? People don't truly recognize these duties until they're as far as possible away from a state of nature in the true civil state. Um, so they're natural in the sense that they're founded on human nature, but they're not natural in the sense that they're kind of like automatic or innate or something like that. Um, If we think of these relationships and the associated affections as natural in the other sense, as we think of them as belonging to the state of nature and kind of like innate and primitive, then Wollstonecraft says, um, we're not thinking of the right thing. We're thinking of something that's weak. Um, I mean, there, there may be something like that, right? Like a feeling, a, a feeling of, um, maternal affection and duty that's natural in that sense, but she says it's weak, it's empty, and it's potentially corrupting, right? So um, I just, there's like several quotes I want to read about this. First is from chapter nine, um, again on page 146. Um, The affection which is put on merely because it is the appropriated insignia of a certain character when its duties are not fulfilled is one of the empty compliments which vice and folly are obliged to pay to virtue and the real nature of things. Right, so what she's saying here is like, it's maybe I should have read that last, but anyway, she's saying there that it's like not a coincidence that there might be a kind of, um, natural in the other sense role of mother but it's because of it's 
an empty compliment which vice and folly is obliged to pay to virtue and the real nature of things. I mean, I don't know exactly how to expand that and like how to um, um, like cash out that metaphor as people say, right? Like how to turn, but, um, but it's somehow or other like, um, even when we're not in the true civil state, we're kind of like imperfect images of it, <laughs> to use Plato's um, other metaphor, right? <laughs> like we're kind of um, we're we're kind of like going through the somehow like acting out the roles that we would have in a rational society, but we're but we're not doing it right, so it's empty. Um, um, here's another quote. This is from chapter 10 on page 157. Um, Natural affection, as it is termed, I believe to be a very faint tie. So natural affection, as it is termed, so she adds as it, as it is termed because it's not what she thinks properly should be called natural affection. Right, natural affection in the right sense of natural is affection that attaches to your duty that you comes from your station that's been assigned to you rationally in a civil state. But um, natural affection, as it is termed, that is affection that's natural in the other way. Natural is affection as it is termed. I believe to be a very faint tie. Affections must grow out of the habitual exercise of a mutual sympathy. And what sympathy does a mother exercise who sends her babe to a nurse and only takes it from a nurse to send it to a school, right, a boarding school? So like chapter 12, which I didn't assign this year and I didn't assign last time I taught this course, but I did assign it the first time I taught the course. Chapter 12 is like a whole big thing about what is the best way of educating children, where, where the main alternative is between educating them with tutors at home and educating them in boarding school, right? That is private versus public education in the, the, in the way they use those terms then. And I guess they still call private schools public schools in Britain. For the, right? It doesn't mean it's publicly funded. It means it's not inside your house. <laughs> so, and she ends up concluding, she says, like, you're going to find this really surprising, but I think the best thing to do is the way they do at certain rustic country schools where the children live at home at night and they go to school during the day. <laughs> I know that's outlandish, but I think that's the best thing. Anyway, so like chapter 12 is all about that. It's, it has a lot of interesting things in it, but it's like not exactly a, I don't know, it's similar to dilemmas these days. I'm thinking about this because my oldest daughter is going to start high school soon. I'm not sure where she's going to go. But anyway, um, uh, but you know, that's why I didn't assign it. Sometimes I think maybe I should, but in any case, so that, that was all to explain why that was that was the whole digression was just to explain why the mother takes it from a nurse to send it to a school, right? The the point is that the um, natural affection is um, not well. See, I don't, it's hard to say which side to start from here. I think it's kind of like a vicious cycle. It's not strong enough to get the mother to fulfill her duty. What is her duty especially? Well, so apparently, remember, and this is on the previous page, the, the care of children in their infancy is one of the grand duties and next to the female character by nature. So apparently she's thinking especially about breastfeeding, right? As I, I pointed out, it's like that's an issue in Rousseau also. Um, I mean, it's kind of an obvious issue, especially if you don't have like breast pumps or whatever, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, so uh, 
the mother who sends her child off to a nurse that is a wet nurse, right? Like she's having someone else breastfeed her child. So uh, uh, the mother who sends her, her babe to a nurse, now, on the one hand, obviously didn't have that strong a natural affection for it. But on the other hand, because she's not discharging her duty to it, she's not building up a stronger affection. Um, so, and you know, I, mean, I, I guess it should be clear, this is not really about like our issue about breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. Right, I mean, bottle feeding is like the parents still do it. <laughs> right, this is about like sending the child away and having someone else do your duty, having your duty fulfilled by a deputy. Um, well, we do that too, of course, but <laughs> uh, maybe not, well, anyway. So, and here's one more quote. So this is from chapter 11 on page 159. Um, the parent who sedulously endeavors to form the heart and enlarge the understanding of his child. So, I mean, now it's either, either parent. Although, I mean, remember that what she said before is, Um, well, I didn't read the continuation of what she said before. After that paragraph where she said the care of children in infancy is one of the grand duties annexed to the female character by nature, the next paragraph starts, the formation of the mind must be begun very early, right? So the, the idea is because the mother is spending extra time with the child in its infancy, and the care of the mind must begin very early. So this extra duty of education falls on the mother. But nevertheless, by now in the chapter 11, she is talking about both parents and she uses the pronoun gives because as I pointed out, she does that as much as the other authors we've read. So the parent who sedulously endeavors to form the heart and enlarge the understanding of his child has given that dignity to the discharge of a duty Sorry, let me start this again. The parent who sedulously endeavors to form the heart and enlarge the understanding of his child has given that dignity to the discharge of a duty common to the whole animal world that only reason can give. This is the parental affection of humanity and leaves instinctive natural affection far behind. Right, so the point is the whole animal world uh, um, is, I don't know, at least the whole mammalian world, right? I mean, <laughs> not all animals take care of their children, but uh, um, but anyway, so the whole animal world is subject to this duty of of like caring for the children, but um, the parent who sedulously endeavors to form the heart and enlarge the understanding of his child is giving that common animal duty a dignity that only reason can give. And that's the parental affection of humanity, which leaves instinctive natural affection far behind. So again, like there is such a thing as natural affection of a mother for a child in the like state of nature sense in the sense of like innate or instinctive, um, but it's, um, it's weak, it's unreliable, and it lacks the dignity of humanity. It's common to us with all the other animals. So it's not specific to human nature. It's not connected to remember the first one of the first principles at the beginning was in what way is man preeminent over the animals? Reason. I didn't say that exactly right, but something like that. So, um, uh, so like that was an all along answer to are these stations natural or not? Now, I mean, um, Um, so, 
so I guess like you might put it this way, stations or at least stations, or as we say, roles are like, um, or should be socially constructed. That's what we might say. <laughs> they should be socially constructed. Now, I mean, of course, she doesn't mean as people sometimes mean by that, that it's like um, arbitrary, right? That like could be constructed any way because there could be any kind of society. It means that like, and I mean, I should say she doesn't use the terminology socially constructed, right? I'm introducing that. It's, it's kind of like half, it's not a joke, but it's kind of like, um, I don't know, like an attempt to, to, to bring her into a surprising relationship with the way we think about things now, I guess is the way I would put it. So like um, she thinks that uh, the ideal society would be organized by reason. And so the roles that it constructs would be the roles constructed by reason. Um, and um, to be sure, these roles, as we can see, definitely in this case, which is the most important one to her, are, you know, in some part based on some pre existing differences between individuals, right? Like some people can lactate and others can't, <laughs> right? So, uh, like, that, that gives a reason for like distributing roles in certain ways. Um, and uh, she often also mentions talents um, in various connections. Now, I mean, she doesn't say a lot about what she, what kinds of talents she thinks they are, or how they're distributed, or you know whether how much we're born with them and how much they develop, and so on and so forth. But um, uh, it seems from some of the things she think she says that that may also play would also play a role in like in this true civilization that so like if one of the stations is that someone has to be the representative legislator um, so ideally that would be assigned to someone who has the right talents to do it you might think um, so I mean, I'm kind of filling that in, like as a because other than mother and father and child, I guess. Um, she doesn't give well. I guess she meant cert mentioned certain professions like physician. Um, so like, she doesn't. She don't, I don't think there's a clear case where she, or no, I shouldn't say that. There aren't a lot of clear cases where she mentions specifically political stations that would exist in the civil society, in this, in this like true civilization. Um, you know, and you could suspect, so as I said, William Godwin, who I don't think she was very close to at the time she wrote this book, even though they got married later, but I mean, but they were kind of in the same circles. Um, you know, the conclusion of his book is that um, there shouldn't be laws and there shouldn't be government. And like, I mean, not that he advocates an immediate revolution or something, but he says in the progress of time, eventually we'll arrive at the state where there are no laws. He, he, um, you know, he's, he says actually, he denies what all the people we've read so far take for granted, namely that um, people have a right to get together and make laws that will regulate their society. Godwin says that um, there's uh, the law of reason, um, and you can't make a law that says you should ob obey the law of reason because you already have to obey the law of reason. And you can't make a law that says only anything else because by what right can you compel people to do something that goes against the law of reason? <laughs> it's arbitrary, 
right? So, uh, so like in his ideal society, there are no legislators. Um, it, um, it seems the one place where she mentions this is when she says that, um, she says, it may excite laughter when I say this, but I even think that women should have representatives. <laughs> so, um, um, I guess in, in context it makes it clear that she, she means women should be representatives. It's not clear if she's imagining men and women having different representatives or it's, it's, it's not like, it's just a couple sentences, right? Like I can't figure out exactly what she means, but, um, 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 but she does say right after that, of course, the so-called representation we have in the current British political system is like, here she calls it a handle for despotism, <laughs> right? So she's not saying under the, the current system would, could be improved if the women could vote for representatives and be representatives. The current system, she says, doesn't have real representation at all. So she says like the women don't have much to complain about because lots of people aren't represented. <laughs> But um, so it seems like when she says women should be represented, she means in the ideal society, women would be represented. That's, I mean, that, that's a long process to go through to conclude that she thinks the ideal society would have a representative government. But um, so uh, um, for whatever that's worth. Um, um, but in any case, like, uh, um, whatever these roles would would be, and I, I think some of them would be political, and others of them would be professional, like physician, uh, teacher, probably, yeah. Um, how could one have a system of government uh, where no one has power over another? Like she's talking about how, how her first society would be egalitarian, like how yeah, well, I mean, so that's why I kind of stopped myself and, and asked whether she meant absolutely or just as much as possible. And, and, I, and again, I'm not sure what the answer is. If she meant absolutely, then yeah, I think you're right. She would have to be thinking about anarchism, right? In that case, everyone could be completely independent of each other, um, assuming that would work. Godwin has a long proof that it would definitely work, but it's a little bit. Uh, there's there's some weak points in the proof, but anyway, um, so uh, um, but given these hints that she doesn't think of it that way, I feel like yeah, she means um, um, you know everyone should have a say in who's going to make the laws that type of thing. And in that sense, they would be independent and wouldn't have power over each other. Um, I haven't read everything that she wrote and there may be somewhere something else she says about this, but um, I'm trying to remember if she says anything in the vindication of the rights of man, which I did read, but, or men, which I did read, but, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so, um, so the correct order um, is, I mean, I guess I already said this, but well, I already said part of it. So the correct order is that these stations or roles are rationally assigned. Now, you know, so in saying that, you might say, who's doing the assigning here? I mean, no one's doing the assigning, right? It's uh, like we all got together and figured out how society should be organized. <laughs> um, so, I mean, 
Well, I guess in the case of representatives, maybe we're going to have to vote for them. Yeah. I just uh, had a question. Are duties the same as rights? Or I mean, not uh, rights, I mean laws. Like uh, failure to discharge your duties means you lose your rights. So is that the same as like if you violate a law that you are sent to prison or something? It's. Um, Well, so I compared it instead to Locke saying that if you're not capable of understanding your duty, you don't, you can't have a right. Um, and I mean, I took it that the argument there in Locke was that if you're not capable of understanding it, you can't be relied upon to, to discharge it, and therefore you can't be given the right. Um, so it, like, it's not exactly a punishment. And it's not a punishment that someone's going to inflict on you for sure, right? Like, so in the example that she gives, she's saying that the, the, the parents who don't fulfill their duty to the child lose the right of, um, uh, to expect affection and respect and so forth from the child. So, like, it's not like uh, you know the ch the child goes to a judge and says, "My my parents didn't fulfill their duty, take away their right." It's like they can't expect it. Okay. They can't. They have no just claim on it. Um, I mean, it might again if this ideal society has laws. <laughs> Then, you know, the laws might somehow reflect that in some cases. Right? Just as we actually do have a law where children can go to a judge and say, you know, my parents aren't fulfilling my duty, you know. They, but, uh, um, but that's not primarily what she's talking about here, I don't think. Um, she's, she's talking to the person who's in this position. Which imposes duties on them and, and also gives you rights. And she's saying, don't expect the rights if you're not going to fulfill the duty. Um, right. So, I mean, so I say the stations are rationally assigned. I mean, I think, like, for the most part, the idea is that they're self assigned, right? Like, people recognize their duty. Uh, you know, whether there's cases where we're going to use voting or whatever, again, there aren't enough details here for me to, to say that. Um, but, um, and I mean, I should say once more, like, why is that? Why aren't there a lot of details about the ideal society? I think, you know, she's mostly focused on how things are out of order in our society. To call her attention to that. Um, if that can be fixed, then the rest will take care of itself, so to speak. Um, so, uh, right, so the correct order is that, like, from your station, you, our duties are derived, and with duties go rights and affections. And also, the exercise of duty produces virtue. I mean, this this that may seem kind of circular or something, but it's actually like an old circle that Aristotle already talks about. You know, like to be virtuous is to be kind of like disposed to do your duty. And the way you attribute you acquire that disposition is to fulfill the duties. Right? Just like Aristotle says, you know, like. You become courageous by practicing acts of courage. Um, right, so she says this. This is in chapter nine on page 145. Um, For man is so constituted that he can only attain a proper use of his faculties by exercising them and will not exercise them unless necessity of some kind first set the wheels in motion. Virtue, likewise, can only be acquired by the discharge of relative duties. In that paragraph, she's explaining why the um, wealthy and idle can't become virtuous. 
right? Because they have nothing to set the wheels in motion. Um, but uh, but I think you know, taking it out of the context, you can tell she thinks how it should work, right? Is that you discharge your duties, and that will make you work. Um, and then uh, virtue produces respect. Um, That's the way it should be, right? The second one of the first principles in chapter one was what acquirement exalts one being above another? Virtue would be spontaneously replied, <laughs> right? So like virtue is what ought to be expected. Res sorry, respected. Um, and in the ideal society, that respect, along with affection, I think would be the reward for virtue and for the discharge of duty, which makes you virtuous. So, um, um, so also in chapter nine on page 146, I mean therefore to infer that the society is not properly organized which does not compel men and women to discharge, discharge their respective duties by making it the only way to acquire that countenance from their fellow creatures, which every human being wishes some way to attain. Right, so the, the incentive, the, the necessity that should get the wheels working <laughs> is that you want to deserve the, deserve the respect of your fellow creatures. And in the properly organized society, the only way to do that will be to be virtuous. Um, says on page 149, um, a truly benevolent legislature always endeavors to make it the interest of each individual to be virtuous. So, um, I mean, it's not explained how this is gonna work. Certainly not the way they tried to do it in Sparta, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but when the true society is set up, it will be set up in such a way that everyone has an incentive to be virtuous. And what will be the incentive? Because, so you might think the incentive would be, well, we'll pay you to be virtuous. But um, as we'll see, she thinks respect to wealth is one of the worst corruptions of this whole order, right? So in the ideal society, people won't want very much money. They'll want enough to take care of their needs and buy some books and have maybe just one servant. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, still can't imagine people with no service, but uh, um, and you know, like give money to the poor or whatever. I mean, I guess I I don't know if that's supposed to be talking about the ideal society or a current society. But anyway, they you know they want enough money to take care of their needs, but they won't want extra money because it won't get them. Anymore. So, uh, um, so what will they, um, and, you know, and presumably this society will be set up so that everyone is independent. So independent meaning that like minimum, they don't have to rely on someone else to, right? They can work for their own subsistence whether it's by like actually making their own stuff or, um, you know, running a shop or being a physician or whatever. So, uh, so you can't like bribe people into being virtuous by paying them, but you don't need to because um, in the true society, people will realize that they, they can't get other people's respect unless they're virtuous. And everyone wants that, she says. And I guess the point is, everyone should want that. 
or at least, I mean, it's a little bit complicated. I mean, everyone should want it properly given, right? Like in the current state of society, although people want it, they really shouldn't because it's given for the wrong thing. Um, instead, she says, this is in chapter 12. She says that, you know, um, or is it in chapter eight? It's in one of the chapters I didn't assign this year. She says that, uh, you know, the reason concern for reputation is so bad is that we shouldn't care about our reputation with other human beings. We should care about our reputation in God's eyes. That, I think, is the same thing as saying, right, our reputation in the eyes of reason, which would be our reputation in this true society, right? Like, that's what people would respect you for. So in this true society, this universal desire for respect would be a good desire, even though in this society it isn't. <laughs> um, so in our state of partial civilization, so now I'm like making a transition from the true society to the bad society we're in, right? So in our state of partial civilization, these stations are assigned to people by prescription. Right, like because people have always fulfilled a certain role, they have to keep doing it. Um, and uh, that makes them into vestiges of barbarism. Right, I mean, because the, the, the way those roles got set up and assigned to begin with was not reason but force. Um, and now, even though we're in this kind of civil society, the fact that we hold on to those arrangements means that there's vestiges of barbarism in the, in the midst of our, of our civilization. Um, and uh, when that happens, this whole order is upset, turned backwards, um, perverted, she sometimes says, which also means turned backwards. <laughs> Right, so this is also on page 149. It's actually before the part I was just reading. The preposterous distinctions of rank which render civilization a curse by dividing the world between voluptuous tyrants and cunning envious dependents. Right, so this is something she comes back to a lot, that both sides of these wrong relationships are corrupted by them. Right. On the dominating side, people become voluptuous tyrants. And on the dominated side, people become cunning and envious. And those are both bad characters, according to her. Um, so by dividing the world between voluptuous tyrants and cunning, envious dependents, corrupt almost 